Barbing, barbing. August 2017, a submarine goes missing off the coast of Copenhagen in Denmark. And I feel like with the recent Titan submersible that went missing, the whole world was watching that. They were following the story every step of the way, and it kind of felt like history was repeating itself. Because six years ago in 2017, there was another missing submarine that literally captivated the entire world. And maybe it's the fact that when someone goes missing, we talk about how time is the most important thing. It is the only thing on our side. The first 48 hours are crucial. I mean, really, like the first hour, the first 12 hours are crucial. But with submarines, you're underwater. You only have so much oxygen. I mean, literally, there is a finite clock that starts ticking down the minute that you go under. Maybe that's why we're so fascinated and captivated by these cases. Maybe it's the idea of being trapped in the ocean that makes people morbidly curious. Or the fact that so many people have gone on submarines. They've stated, once you go on a submarine, there is nothing comparable in the human experience. Because as you're going down, you hear the wind, you hear the waves, there's all these sounds. But once you're under, there's no noise. It's so silent. It's so, it, it's a different, I wouldn't necessarily call it peaceful, they stated, but it's, it's a different type of feeling. You're completely isolated from the world. There's nothing there. Just total isolation and sometimes total darkness. They said, truly, it compares to nothing. You're far away from home and you feel very alone. It's like a spaceship. And the idea that people could be trapped in a situation like that, it makes people emotionally invested. Or the fact that in 2017, when that submarine in 2017 went missing, it was a homemade amateur submarine. It was no homemade. Way. And the only two people that were trapped inside of it right then and there were practically strangers to one another. They didn't even really know each other. So one of the two passengers was Peter Madsen. He was the one that built this amateur submarine. He was a bit of a small celebrity in Denmark, and they all considered him like this eccentric inventor, this builder of all these crazy machines. He built rockets, submarines. This is his third submarine. So he's got like a whole wild persona. And the other passenger was 30-year-old Kim Vall. She was a world-renowned journalist who had gone under with Peter to interview him about his submarine for Wired magazine. What? So she's a journalist for Wired magazine. She's a freelance journalist. I mean, I'm going to go over her life story, but her credentials are out of this world. I mean, I don't even want to say that she was a journalist for Wired magazine. She was working with the UN. I mean, this woman is so talented. And now both of them are missing underwater and only peter would come back up alive kim vall would be tortured killed and dismembered in that submarine when authorities searched peter Matson's computers later they found countless videos of snuff films of women being beheaded tortured even burned alive the same day that he went into that submarine with kim vall he googled girl decapitated agony As always, full show notes are available at RottenMinglePodcast.com. There are two documentaries on this case, and HBO's Undercurrent and Netflix's Into the Deep. I would recommend Undercurrent. A lot of Kim's friends and family worked with the producers, and her story was shared really well in the two-part series. But I think the Netflix one is... It's very controversial, it is very chilling, and it primarily focuses on a ton of footage because right before Peter committed murder, he was having a filmmaker come into his workshop every single day and basically create a documentary for his life. So there's just countless hours and hours upon footage of Peter just saying the most unhinged things, which at the moment, it didn't seem that crazy, but in hindsight, it's really chilling. And it's all kind of centered around like, how could this brilliant inventor do this? So uh, both were used as sources, as well as a bunch of other sources will be listed below in the show notes. And with that being said, oh, and one more thing, there is a Kim Wall Foundation that I will also link in the description, but we're going to come back to it. And her parents wrote a book called A Silenced Voice that will also be linked. But with that being said, let's get into it. 
Kim Vall was born in Sweden. She grew up in Sweden, like near the Sweden-Denmark border. And both of her parents were journalists, which I think is so interesting. So it's kind of like an insane life. It said that most of her childhood should be in these newsrooms. Like she's probably on the sideline reading books because you're like a kid. And all these adults are running around freaking out. She would grow up listening to her parents, listen to strangers, collecting stories and truly trying to get the heart of people, like trying to understand what they wanted to be shared. And I'm sure all of this affected her in a very big way because as she's growing older, she's like, I want to do that. Kim Vall stated pretty early in her career that she wanted to see how the world works. She said, and I hope that maybe one day I can learn enough to make a difference. And pardon my language, but she like did the damn thing. I think she is one of the most accomplished people I've ever read about. So she's an independent journalist that wrote about everything and everyone that she felt did not have a voice. She wrote for Harper's, The Guardian, The New York Times, Foreign Policy, Vice, Slate, Wired, South China Morning Post, The Atlantic. I mean, anyone, you name it, Time Magazine. Her work has been translated into several different languages. She has traveled the world. She went to Sri Lanka to report post-war efforts. She went to Haiti after an earthquake. She went to North Korea. Wow. Yeah, she was one of the journalists that went to North Korea. I mean, when I tell you she wanted to see the world and make a difference, she did that all before she turned 30 years old. Just even reading her writings and her articles, it sounds like I'm reading someone that has lived 100 years on this planet. Like just the way that she's able to connect with people and understand their stories is so admirable. She's got two master's degrees, one from the Columbia School of Journalism. She was a United Nations press fellow. She was learning Mandarin. She briefly went to the University of Beijing at one point. She went to college in London. She was literally an unstoppable human. I mean, like her career, while it was short, it was incredibly prolific. Her professors at Columbia were so proud of her because they're like, wow, she's one of the students we're going to brag about. We're going to be like... I helped make that, you know, and they would say that she's so smart, so tenacious. And even though it sounds like she had been in all these dangerous environments and going to all these places where most people would be so nervous to go like North Korea, she would never knowingly put herself in these situations and do something reckless. It said that Kim Vall had a maybe strong level of skepticism as most journalists. But her whole thing was, okay, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? And like some voices just do not get heard. So she would go to these nuclear waste sites and write about, report about climate change. I think it's really hard to not deeply admire someone like that and also just really want to be around someone like that. One of her friends said her strongest memory of Kim Vall was they were both in Delhi, India. They're both working there. And Kim comes up to the friend group and she's like, hey guys, you want to try this new Korean place for dinner? And they all agreed and they met up with her, but she starts leading them into, and this is how she describes it, like a very dangerous part of Delhi. Like the part that every single person is like, don't ever go to this part of Delhi. Bad things happen in this part of Delhi. Don't go there. Like every city has their bad neighborhoods. She's walking them straight into the bad neighborhood. Kim's just leading the group, pushing through the crowd of people. She turns into this tiny, quote, rundown building is how they describe it. And her friends are really hesitant, like, I don't think I really want Korean food that badly. And they follow her upstairs. And it's like, you would never believe a restaurant like that existed in there. It was just the most quaint, homey Korean restaurant with Korean immigrants that owned it. And just the amount of culture and energy that was in that tiny, they said it was the best Korean food that they've ever had. And they said that this incident really describes Kim. She really liked to bring light to things that you would never guess to be so fantastic. Like that's the kind of person she was. So in 2017, she's working as a full-time freelance journalist, which is... um. 
like it's really difficult, okay? I mean, I would imagine being a journalist is already so challenging, but as a freelance journalist, you have to basically, I mean, figure everything out yourself. You've got to find the story, do the reporting, sell the stories. Your income is constantly fluctuating. But Kim is seasoned. She even had gone through these courses, like hostile environment training. So she was trained on what to do in the event of a horrible car accident, how to provide aid, what to do if she was being held hostage, or if she was kidnapped or in like a big mob situation. And this case is so infuriating because I think the anger that comes with this case is that she was just trying to do her job. She did everything right. She was just trying to do her job. So summer of 2017, Kim is living in Copenhagen with her boyfriend. She's doing freelance work, and it it just felt like the pieces of her life were kind of coming together perfectly. And she told her friends that she loved Copenhagen. She said, it's so cozy. It's like, I mean, she grew up not too far away from it, and she said she was outrageously in love with the city. She's trying to figure out her future. It's a little daunting. It's a little scary, but it's working. And it just feels like when one thing goes right, everything starts kind of going right. So Kim's career, although it's already so successful, it was just about to take off even more. So she's living with her boyfriend and both of them get a very interesting work opportunity that opens up in China. So they're like, let's do it. We're going to pack up all of our bags and freaking move to China. Like, this is insane. But she kind of knows Mandarin, so it kind of makes sense. And this is like the next step in both of their careers. So they tell all of their friends, guys, we're moving to China. And it's like this huge, huge thing. Her friends are like, we got to throw this huge going away party. I mean, this is incredible. Congratulations. And the couple is so well loved. A lot of people were going to be showing up. But Kim is a workaholic. And she's like, okay, let me get one more story before I leave. No way. One last story. There was this man in Denmark that everyone knew. He was known as the Elon Musk of Denmark. I think it's it's quite of a stretch. Look, I don't know if being called an Elon Musk is a compliment to some people. To others, it's the worst insult you can get. But I think at least financially and to a degree scale-wise, it's a bit of a stretch for this guy. His name is Peter Madsen, and he was eccentric. People described him as being wacky. Other people called him a genius inventor. That's what they called him. But the truth is, the guy never really invented anything. He just built rockets and submarines. Those are all things that have already been invented. So he's just a maker of things, I guess. And uh, he would do it on a very, very small scale. His whole dream was to put Denmark on the map of producing rockets. And he told everyone... Why does the government need to fund rockets? If a civilian wants to build a rocket, they should be able to build a rocket. Like, they should be able to be an astronaut. He wanted to be the first amateur astronaut. Okay. And build, like, the first amateur rocket company. Basically, everything he knew about rockets was pretty much self-taught. So he would give a lot of poetic TED Talks about not limiting yourself. Look, the guy was... Yeah, he was wacky. I mean, you can see why his story appealed to Kim. And in fact, Wired Magazine was like, yes, Kim, do the story. We're going to buy it. Interview him. Find out what this guy's shtick is. Let's get to the bottom of it. Am I going to live through this? Plainly putting it, we live. And you're going to die anyway, and there's no way around it. Why not get the best out of life? And that's how I think of it. Kim's friend said, when it comes to the type of work that Kim typically does, this is a low-hanging fruit for her. Mm. This is a walk in the park. I mean, she's usually going to hostel in North Korea. And now you're saying, just go interview this weirdo. To her, I mean, she's already got her guards up. She's like not the type of woman to let her card down. It's always up. But this is supposed to be an easier project. So she had heard that he had this amateur, homemade, privately owned submarine. She reaches out to see if he's interested in an interview. And on August 10th, she went to his little workshop to do this quick little sit-down interview. So right after this, she's supposed to go to her going away party that her friends are throwing for her and her boyfriend because they're about to move to China. But Madsen is like, hey, you know what? You want to go on the sub tonight? Like the waters are calm. We should go. It's going to take like two, three hours. Wait, the submarine is, where? where is it? Copenhagen. Um, yeah, yeah. He's like, you want to go? I mean, the waters are calm. It'll be great. I can show you how it works. You can do the rest of the interview, get pictures, whatever you need to do. I mean, she had already interviewed him. He seemed very normal and not that wacky of an inventor. I think that his reputation precedes himself. Not in a good way, but he's a little quirky. But it's probably because he's super passionate. She runs back home and tells her boyfriend, hey, 
I'm going to go on the sub. Like, this is perfect because I can maybe even pump out this article before we move to China. Like, it'll be great. So she's very excited about her story. I mean, she's the type of journalist that gets really passionate about her work. She boards the sub at around 7.30 p.m. that night. And there is a video of them departing out and she's waving to whoever is filming. Because, you know, it's a submarine. It's not a boat. So I imagine if people are at the harbor, they're like, whoa, like there's... It looks like a cartoon. It's a big black tube with a little tower that you come out of, like a little tube uh-huh. that you come out of on top. And they're like waving by. How big is it though? It fits about eight people. And I think it's like eight meters. It's pretty big. Mm. When you look at it, it looks like it would fit more than eight people. But mm. I guess most of it is like the engine and stuff. I would say maybe it's like a double-decker bus and more. Maybe like two double-decker buses. Yeah, oh, it's huge. huge. And it's like painted in kind of like this spotchy black color oh it just yeah so i think that even the submarine itself becomes like this whole dark imagery for this case so there's a video of them departing and she's waving and she looks very happy and very excited it doesn't look like she would have ever gotten into a sub with someone that was giving her any red flags And it's not every day you go into a sub. And side note, this is not like the Titan situation. They're not going down super far. It's not like this impressive feat where they're trying to beat records or go where nobody's gone before or have only gone a few times. It wasn't like that at all. So truly, the risks of this were incredibly low. They're probably just submerging like 20 feet. They're like, we're submerged. That was about it. And everyone knew where she was, who she was with. And he's like a minor celebrity in Denmark. It's not this random nobody. Like everyone in Denmark knows this guy. Everyone in Scandinavia knows this guy. So she takes all of her precautions as usual. She even texted her boyfriend. And many would find these text messages very chilling later. But she texted him. I'm still alive, by the way. But I'm going down now. Love you. He brought cookies and coffee, though. She said that? The I'm still alive, by the way, text message would later haunt a lot of people. Now, the whole submarine excursion and interview was supposed to take like a few hours max. But when 10 p.m. pulls around and she's still not home, her boyfriend starts to get a little bit concerned. She didn't even text him, so that's weird. He waits just a little while longer. Probably like all of us, he's probably trying to calm himself down and thinking of all these very reasonable, very rational explanations on why she might be running late. But when she's still not back and he checks the clock and it's 2.30 in the morning, he's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to call the Coast Guard because this is insane. So at 3.30, the Coast Guard start their search for the missing submarine. They sent two rescue helicopters, three ships. The Navy got involved in looking for this submarine and the submarine is called the Nautilus. Side note, it's often said to be the world's largest privately owned submarine, so not owned by a massive submarine corporation or a government military entity. Oh, it is, this submarine. That's what they say, but um, (laughs) if you've been listening since the start of Rotten Mango, we learned that the cartels had bought old Russian submarines to transport trucks. So I would say maybe it's like the most legally and openly Mm. owned submarine that are not owned by um, shadowy entities. Okay. Like organized crime entities. Okay, but but it's still considered big. Yeah, Yeah. so it's huge. And uh, now it's missing. And everyone had the same question that they had when the Titan went missing. How do you lose a giant submarine? How does it go missing? Who's aboard the submarine? What's going on? And how much oxygen do they have left? So we know a bit about Kim. Let me tell you a little bit about Peter Madsen. Peter Madsen calls himself the maker of extreme machines. He would go on these TED Talks and say some wild things like, what if you got a crazy idea that you wanted to leave planet Earth? What if you got the idea that you wanted to go to space? Well, he made TED Talks? Yeah. Wow. People today, they go out age 25 and they get a pension. Age 25, they worry about what's going to happen when they're 65. The banks are telling us to think about that sort of thing. You can have a prepaid funeral today so that there's no trouble when it happens. I mean, what kind of a world is it that we don't let ourselves live while we do it? Being aware of the fact that it has an end and we don't know when it happens can be a very strong motivation for life, for enjoying every second that we have of it enjoying everything that we can use to tell stories, to enjoy the other people on this beautiful, wonderful planet. I just think it's so important 
to remember that we don't live forever and to spend that time remaining, that short remaining time, in the very best way. Take a look at this flying machine. Now, I'm looking at it in the sense of a sculpture. It's beautiful. It looks incredibly beautiful. I've always wanted to build my own airplane. I've, I've wanted it since I was a kid. I present to you the most powerful machine ever conceived by mankind. Six, five, four, three, two, one. He was very unhinged, but people liked it at the time. A biographer named Thomas said that um, he was the biographer for Peter Madsen. He wrote a book on Peter Madsen's life. Thomas said that Peter had a way of just making people excited. Like he knew how to sell his vision and the dream and his whole vision was not even just about him, but it translated to other people and it was, you can do whatever you want. You don't need government funding to create a rocket company. He wrote this before the murder? Or? Yeah. Oh, wow. He followed Peter Madsen around and wrote this book, and it was like this very heroic embodiment oh of almost this larger-than-life character. Madsen would often use his own story as proof. So Madsen grew up in a really harsh environment. His parents were Carl and Annie. An interesting thing to note, his mom Annie was 36 years younger than their dad. Than his dad, yeah, yeah, yeah. And his dad Carl was <laughs> brutal. Grew up in... Germany and he felt like the only way to communicate with his kids was to beat him like you want to get something into your kid beat him you want to get something out of your kid beat him like that was his end-all be-all only form of communication Peter Madsen did not have a normal upbringing he likened his childhood to growing up under the direction of a concentration camp commander Eventually, his parents divorced, and Peter was sent to live with Carl, his dad. Which, I mean, it was really rough. Like, he was forbidden to talk to his mom. Forbidden. His dad would not allow it. And this is very important later. It seems like his mom was the one that was nice to him, compared to the dad. But maybe he felt like she was failing to protect him. This is a thing that I see a lot with male killers. A lot of the times, the dad is abusive. The mom is also a victim of abuse, but she is unable to protect the son from the abuse of the dad. And instead of hating the dad, they hate the mom. It's very interesting. So that's kind of what happened to Peter Madsen. He did not take it out on his abusive dad. He hates his dad, but there's almost a level of respect when he talks to him. It's like, oh, we're just very different, and he was a very horrible person. But there's still that level of fear. With his mom, he said, I didn't really want to live with her anyway. She was as stupid as a cat. She didn't know anything. If that does not sound like the origins of a strong hatred for women, I don't know what does. But we're still not there yet. We're still on the rockets, okay? He said that he was always interested in rockets. Like, he liked it at a young age. He kept pursuing it. He did a little bit of engineering studying, but most of it was self-taught. I'm a maker of extreme machines, I'd say. I am uh, originally edu educated a little bit as an engineer, a little bit as a, a naval engineer, a marine engineer. On a test day, I'll sit on a rock crying because it's so hard to organize people and to make it all work. And there's so much you have to think about and you can be Five, very, very alone in it. Four, three, two, one, zero. So he relies on people seeing his vision and believing in him and crowdfunding. But it worked, really. I mean, it worked to a degree. A lot of rich people believed in his vision as well. So he's over there with three submarines. The first one was Freya. It was 20 feet long and it could fit two people. Then he had Kraka. It was reminiscent of a World War II German sub. It fit about three people. And then his latest one, the one that was missing, the Nautilus, it could fit about eight people. And similar to the Titan, um, a lot of the parts were just parts that you could buy at a warehouse. Yeah. 
And once he had those three subs, he starts getting into other things. He was asked by reporters, like, Madsen, what now? Like, you've got three submarines. Are you going to build an even bigger sub? And he, he always had, um, Peter Madsen really wanted to be a main character. That's what I can describe about this guy. He would gaze out when people ask these interview questions. And instead of just being like a businessman who's like, you know what? I think the company directive is A, B, C, and D. He would gaze out into the open air and he would say, I think I'm going to do something else now. I think I'm going to look up at the stars. He's talking about rockets. He wanted to build rockets. And (laughs) keep this in mind. Anytime Peter is interviewed about his submarines, about his rockets, about his accomplishments, this is how he talks. It's almost in this poetic movie character way that people don't ever really talk in real life. It's like he's memorized a line and he's waiting for that perfect question, that perfect moment to blurt it out and make it like this motivational moment that you can put in a black and white photo. Keep this in mind for later. In 2008, he becomes a co-founder of a rocket company called Copenhagen Suborbitals. And he said that he wanted to go into space with no astronaut training, One of the first devices they made was a centrifuge. It's like a stick. Imagine a stick sideways. One side has giant fire burst. Mm -hmm. And then the other side had a little um, carriage where he would sit in and it would just spin him around really, really fast nonstop. And then he was like, I'm training for space. It's completely incredible. This is an incredible ride. We got to 6Gs. I could see it on the instrumentation. And uh, I choose to carry on up to 7Gs. And I was effectively reaching uh, my own limit. Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's been a fantastic ride. Really. (laughs) He wanted to be up there with the stars. He did not want government funding. He wanted to build the rocket out of things that you could find in the local warehouse. And he was getting funded. So, I mean, he poured a lot of his own money into it, all of the money from his TED Talks. He's living part-time in his sub. He's crowdfunding this huge project. And as for the employees for this company, a lot of them were interns or volunteers. They were a lot of young people who had the knowledge, probably didn't have the credentials to get a job, but they had such deep knowledge of engineering. They were genuinely fascinated by it. And for whatever reason, it didn't translate academically, or maybe they didn't have the funds to go into that. But they would just volunteer. And it just, like, imagine how hard and how few people can work on rockets in this world. I mean, think about it. Like, the number of people that's like, I've worked on a rocket before, I don't even know how many there are in this world. So all these students, they would gather, they they studied rockets for fun, and they started working for Madsen. And because he was getting so much attention, the biographer even followed Madsen around, started writing his story, his life story. There were other people, a filmmaker that was making a movie about quote, Rocket Madsen, that's what they all called him. Her footage was actually used extensively in the trial and in the Netflix doc. But it was very strange, okay? Very strange energy at the rocket company. It was very invigorating, contagious. It's like a time capsule. They said it was like the Danish space age. It was exhilarating to be a part of something big, to see it all come together. And it just proved that you really don't need to be this corporate Fortune 500 company to make things happen. Madsen was not driven by the money. None of the workers were, and it's not like they were trying to sell the rockets later. They just wanted to prove they could do it. That was most people's passion. But Madsen had a different passion, too. His passion was kind of telling everyone what to do. Here's what's interesting. He's not necessarily bossy. He's controlling. It seemed like he really wanted control. And all of that would be easily overlooked because he was so charismatic. And because he had this such a larger-than-life personality and reputation, anytime he did anything questionable, it was chalked up to him just being quirky and eccentric. He was more of a cartoonish figure than a human, and he lived by cartoonish figure standards of human decency. I think people were just really impressed that he was selling this big dream, and a lot of people liked him. Now, the Royal Navy of Denmark, on the other hand, not impressed. They actually knew about the submarine long, 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 long time ago, the Nautilus, when it was being built. And they asked him, hey, since you're doing this in Denmark and like something happens to you, we're going to be looking for you. Can we just see the plans, like the floor plans of your sub? I mean, legally, we can't stop you from building the sub. We just want to like give our input, give some help if you want it. They basically took one look at it and was like, that thing is going to sink one day and we're going to be doing search and rescue. 
They didn't say it to him, but they were all thinking it. They all felt like the submarine was way too heavy. It just was not built well. And when the submarine finally went missing in 2017, some of the Royal Navy commanders thought, oh my God, it finally happened. They didn't even seem surprised. I mean, yeah, they were worried, but maybe not surprised. So they gather their teams and they start searching. And and remember, they were reported missing by Kim's boyfriend at 2.30, the early morning of August 11th, 2017. About eight hours into the search, the sun comes up. And a submarine was spotted from a nearby lighthouse in Crew Bay. This is like the south area of Copenhagen. And the submarine was there. It's just floating, like bobbing around in the water. And there's a man standing in the tower above the water, like the tower of the submarine. And he's able to make radio contact with the Navy. And he told him, hey, everything's fine. Everyone on the boat is fine. We're all good. We're just having some technical issues. And that's why we went missing. The Navy is like, okay, thank God. But like, wow, this guy is really something. But once they get word that he's safe and he's being picked up by a fisherman, most of the naval commanders were told to go report on a new task. Like, don't be wasting your energy on this. We've got bigger things going on. So a lot of them are packing their bags and they start getting bombarded with people radioing in and calling them. The sub is sinking, the sub is sinking, the sub is sinking. What? Okay, like just two seconds ago, quite literally two seconds ago, It was floating. It was fine. Nothing was wrong. There was no urgency in Peter's voice. He wasn't saying, hey, the sub is sinking. You need to come rescue me. I'm in the tower. Like, I'm going to jump into the water soon. Nothing. What just happened in the span of like one to two minutes? The sub indeed was sinking. Madsen jumped into the water. He was rescued by fishermen, brought to the harbor, and there were journalists, media waiting for him there because this story had been a new emerging hot current event news. And they're all asking like, are you okay, Peter? Are you okay? And he's giving them the thumbs up. But the Navy is watching and they're like, something's not right. Something is not right about this. They said, submarines do not sink like that. What? Like, maybe if you're in the water, but not when you're not submerged. Submarines just don't. He could have saved his sub. The way his sub sank, it was very slow. It was very weird. There was no accident. There was no impact. There was nothing. So what does that even mean? Like... They're saying, we know subs. If there's been a submarine that's been going successfully and being submerged, it doesn't just randomly sink on you, especially when you're not submerged, Mm. when half of it is above water. Got it. It's just really bizarre. Maybe if it's the first time you're testing this sub, or if the sub had made impact with something, or if there was a, even with an engine failure, it probably wouldn't sink. So they're like, why did it sink? It's just really weird. I mean, he would have tried to save his sub, right? This guy is known for his submarine, his love for the Nautilus. I mean, come on. And someone is still missing. Because Kim Vol would not make it out of that submarine by the time that it sank. So where is the journalist? Other Navy officers also raised their eyebrows. They said the way that the sub looked like it was sinking, it just looked like it was diving. So the way that... (laughs) Okay, if a submarine was to sink from above water, it looks very different from a submarine that's going on a mission and being submerged. It looks like it was just going on a mission. It Mm -hmm. looks like someone had autopiloted to be submerged Mm -hmm. and then was like, oh my God, it's sinking and jumped. Got it. It wasn't like tilting to one side. It wasn't, there was none of that. It's just like, okay, this is really bizarre. It looks like it's working fine. Now, the first thing that you would do if you are a sub owner and this is your baby, your pride and joy, I mean, what you're known for, what would you do before you jump off that sub into the water if it's sinking? I don't know. Try to save it? I don't know. (laughs) You close the hatch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you don't want it to... Fill with water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the hatch is like in the tower that you go down. It's like this giant steel plate. You close it and no water can leak in because it's a submersible, right? So you close the hatch. He doesn't close the hatch. And this guy has created three submarines. It's He didn't just buy them. He built them. Wait, how did they know they saw it? Yeah. What? There's a bunch of people around. There's a lighthouse nearby. Like, they uh-huh. saw it. Did he they did ask, not... where's the other girl? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, we're going to get to that. So Madsen, this inventor, maker, quote, genius, left the hatch open, letting water flow into the submarine. The Navy commanders took one look at that, and they believed that he sunk it intentionally. They said, you only leave the hatch open when you want to cover something up. Mm. But more importantly, where is Kim Vall? And why is Peter Madsen not frantically talking about her or looking for her? 
So they walked over to the cops that were at the harbor and the Navy commander said, listen, we're from the Navy. We can't really arrest people. And in my opinion, there's something wrong here. Like you need to get to the bottom of it. I think you need to arrest this guy. They said that you have a situation where a submarine sinks, two people were missing, and only one comes out. This is not right. When he was first asked about where Kim Vall was, he said, oh, she's fine. I dropped her off the night before at around 10.30 p.m., close to the harbor where she lived. He even um, listed the specific harbor that he dropped her off. They asked him, well, how do you know Kim? He stated, oh, I don't really know much about her other than that she was a journalist for Wired doing a piece on me. And it's not like I do background checks when a journalist calls and says, can I interview you? And it looked like he just really wanted to go home. But the police, they had other plans. The whole thing is not adding up. If you dropped Kim off, why would she not be home? And what a coincidence that you guys were out together, both go missing, but it was not together. Everything felt very off. And while the cops are escorting Mads into the car to arrest him, there are reporters just hurling questions at him. And the way he responds also makes people just kind of perk up in their chairs. They're chasing him and they're asking him, what happened? What happened? And he said, I'm fine. I'm a little sad, a little sad. Seeing the Nautilus go down was extreme. He told reporters that the Nautilus had sunk. How? Valve failure, ballast failure. His biographer, Thomas, the one that he worked closely with, he saw this on TV and it was just like something was itching at him. Even in the event of failure, Peter is known to be poetic. It's all about image for Peter. He would have said, this is what the biographer who worked so closely with him said, he would have said something along the lines of, this was the crown jewel of my work, and now it's at the bottom of the sea. But this is the way it is. This is how you learn, grow, and experience the glory of such things. But instead he looks like, it's sunk valve failure. He looks kind of... Like he doesn't want to communicate. The whole demeanor just, it just wasn't right. And Peter Madsen is used to failure because when you're creating rockets and submarines, you're going to fail, you know? And every single time, he's always been poetic. He was also asked about Kim and he stated, there was no one on board but me. No one else on board? No one. So he was taken to the police station and questioned, and get this, when he's talking about his sub sinking, he would go off on these overly technical tangents that the police clearly could not debunk or couldn't even question him on because they don't know anything about subs, they don't know the jargon, but when it came to Kim, he had very little to say. Even the way he just dropped her off, it was very curt, the way that he described it is very short, and the investigator stated, in terms of shock, either someone remembers everything or they remember nothing. That's how shock works. But Peter remembered everything about the submarine sinking and remembered nothing about Kim. It is inconsistent. Nobody saw it then, though. But in the footage of him being asked all of these questions, in the footage of him coming to the dock after the sub sank, the truth is right there. Because there, on the left side of his nose, is a little bit of Kim's blood. Meanwhile... The media was told that Madsen reported to dropping Kim off earlier that night. And so everyone believes that she had gotten off the submarine and something bad happened to her. That's how much everyone just generally thought that Madsen was a good character. But even that didn't make the most statistical sense because in places like Denmark, it is very, very rare to get murdered or kidnapped. And Copenhagen is actually considered one of the safest cities in the entire world. Now, nobody is saying that bad things cannot happen to you in places like this. But what are the odds that something happens to her in Copenhagen, and then his sub sinks right after, and it's just, what are the odds? When Kim's friends and fellow journalists heard the news of her disappearance, they were shocked, but their journalist brains went into overdrive. None of it made sense. There weren't enough facts, and the facts weren't adding up. There wasn't enough details about her disappearance. And they said, what do you mean she's missing? She's been to North Korea. I mean, she's been to some shady, shady places. For her to go missing interviewing this guy Mm -hmm. is a bit weird. The police started to follow the lead Madsen gave, and they went to the harbor that he stated that he dropped Kim off, right? And they're trying to figure out, was Kim seen meeting someone else? Was she picked up by someone? Which direction did she walk off to? Thankfully, there was a bar nearby that had extensive CCTV range of the harbor, and they combed through the footage. Nobody, nobody that looked like Kim had gotten to the harbor that night. On top of that, there were no eyewitnesses of Kim that night, which is huge. She was all over the news in Denmark at this point. I mean, this was like the biggest story of that time. 
I mean, surely someone would have come forward if they saw her. The search for Kim continues, but instead of looking near the harbor, now the authorities kind of start searching in the waters. Their concern was, what if Kim is still in the sub? There could be an air pocket and she could still be alive and we have to get her. The Navy sent divers down and much of the sub was flooded with water since the hatch was left open by Madsen deliberately. And they start going to all the windows, peering in. There were no survivors that they could see. Additionally, it did not seem feasible or safe for them to go inside. What? So, just to make the timeline more clear. August 10th, that night, August 10th, like 7.30, they get onto the sub. That morning, August 11th, Madsen is found and the submarine sinks. Not a single trace of Kim. The very next day, August 12th, Madsen is arrested and he appears in court. And this is like a like a preliminary hearing. He's not even technically really charged. His story wasn't adding up. There were just pretty, pretty big holes in his story, so it didn't make sense. August 13th, the authorities start lifting the submarine out of the water. Mm. Their plan was to get one of those giant, giant, almost like cargo ships, like Navy ships, lift the sub up with these giant cranes that are on the ship and hope that it won't snap in half, bring it to the harbor where they would drain the water, I think like 9,000 gallons of water, and start searching the inside. That was the first real evidence that their suspicions were not unfounded. Kim was not in the submarine, but everything was a mess. Authorities reported finding what looked like pieces of flesh in the boat, in the sub. And there was still some water that didn't fully drain, and it had come up to their blue suits. They touched it, and when they got out, one of the naval commanders, they just had this weird feeling. And they sniffed it. It smelled very strongly of blood. And yes, it's a steel submarine. And some people think that blood has a metallic scent, which it does. But the naval commander is saying, no, when you're talking about blood in water that's been kind of diluted in water, it's a very specific, specific smell. And we know that smell. They also found her jacket still in the submarine, which why would anyone leave that? If she had been brought ashore to any harbor, right? Not that one, because clearly there's no footage of her there, but any harbor. She would have taken her things with her. She is not a careless woman. Why would she leave her jacket? She had like tickets, train tickets in the jacket still that she needed to be used. Why would she do that? But it still doesn't get authorities closer to finding Kim. And right now, the whole world seemed to be talking about this incident like they were the Titan. Was this a rescue mission or is it going to be a recovery mission? What's going on? Kim's parents came out to state that they were heartbroken over what was going on. And they said, and I quote, Kim has worked in many dangerous places as her work as a journalist. And there have been many times we were worried about her. That something could have happened in Copenhagen, just a stone's throw away from her childhood home, is something we could have never imagined. Over 10 days later, everyone's worst fears were confirmed. There was a flurry of police activity near the shore, which is not normal in Copenhagen. Media, civilians, everyone waited for a press conference, and everyone's thinking the same thing, but they didn't want to say it out loud. They believed that they found her body, but it was so much worse. They found a woman's torso, without her legs, without her arms, and without her head. Just a torso. It was clearly from manual dismemberment from another human and not ocean life. Authorities stated they do need to do DNA testing, but... This is not really common in Copenhagen, so people thought, what are the odds it's not her? The results would show that it was, in fact, Kim Vall's torso. And this changed everything, including Peter Matson's story. Peter Matson said, you know what, you're right, I didn't drop Kim off. I was too nervous to tell you guys the truth from the get-go. According to his new story, he was opening up the hatch on the sub which you would imagine is very, very heavy because you can't let any of that water come in when you're completely submerged. It's like this giant, giant bolted steel plate and then you gotta push it open so that you can get out once you're above water. He had to hold it up so that they could get through the hatch and get out. But he lost his grip and he said this giant steel hatch came crashing down on Kim as she was trying to leave the, the tower. So it hit her in the head, knocked her out, she fell down and she was dead. Wait, this is when they're trying to leave? Yeah. Not, okay. Yeah. What? So he said he knew it. He was so panicked. He felt awful, just horrible. And as someone who has been at sea for a while, he stated, he didn't know what else to do but give her a funeral at sea. So he threw her body overboard. 
His story conveniently leaves out the part that she was dismembered and the fact that her torso showed evidence of torture. There were markings on her torso that looked like inflicted wounds, yet yeah, torture wounds, as, many, as well as many stab wounds on her private areas were also found. So the authorities did not believe him, and it was scary that a killer could just stare them in the eyes and lie like that. I mean, to think that they would just believe it and send him home, like they had no idea what kind of monster they were working with. So they were determined to prove it. In order to build a case against him, they would have to explain how Kim died. Otherwise, a court would have a very hard time convicting him of murder. And the best way to prove it is to find Kim's body. Finding her head would be crucial in closure for families, but also for justice. If investigators could prove that she had no fractures or blunt force trauma to the head, her, his entire story would be debunked. But finding parts of her body in Crupe nearly impossible they said it's the equivalent of do you know how big a football field is right mm -hmm. think about 10 football fields someone flies over in a helicopter and drops a quarter go look for that quarter yeah that's how hard it was and every day was even harder because the body parts would move because of the water current so they had had to bring in an oceanographer who was at his whole life all he did was study how things move in water he would have to map out okay today we have to search this area because if there was anything dropped at this area it would have moved to this area but then if it was dropped at this area it would move to this it was so complicated and on top of that let me explain if you were in this giant room not this, this room is not giant, but like if you were in a giant room, you could see 10 feet ahead, 20 feet ahead, if there's nothing blocking your field of vision. You could probably see the end of a stadium or a giant ballroom. In the water, you see like a book's length away, or at wow. least this water. That's all you see. The rest is murky. So you can't just go in there and scan an area with your eyes and then be like, okay, like I scanned 100 feet. It's huge. It's looking for a tiny, tiny piece in a giant ocean. October 6th, 56 days of search, 50 divers a day. There are about 3,500 dive times recorded, 200 acres of area covered with the calculation of water movement. In the end, the police found Kim's legs and her severed head. No way. Yeah, and it showed that she had no traces of blunt force trauma or fractures. Peter's second story was a lie. And it was clear, with the evidence of the stab wounds, the prosecutors believed he took Kim down into the sub, trapped her in there, isolated her from the world, basically buried her with her own killer, and sadistically tortured her, killed her, and dismembered her. All because she was a woman doing her job. And before you say, well, it could happen to a man, but it didn't. Peter did not ask any men to come into the sub alone. But he did that week ask many women. It seems like he just wanted to kill any woman that week. The first woman that would be alone in the sub with him was the one that he was going to kill. He asked multiple friends, multiple acquaintances, do you want to go into the sub? Some of these friends asked, oh yeah, great, sure, can I bring my kids? And he said no. And that friend said that was really weird because Peter usually is known for wanting a ton of people around him. He loved big, big gatherings, especially the sub. Like he loved taking people down into the sub. So for him to refuse, it just felt, it felt really off. So she said, mm, maybe not. Like I got to watch the kids so I can't go. Now, the police searched through Peter's phone and his computer, which, side note, Peter really did not want to give them access to his computer. He kept screaming that he had trade and business secrets on there that the police were trying to steal. It was a huge ordeal, but they had a forensic expert try and get all the data from his devices. And the day that he got on the submarine with Kim, he was Googling girl beheading and the word agony. It was premeditated. He did it rationally, intentionally, to fulfill some vile sexual fantasy that he had. His computer revealed... A plethora of evidence, I mean, just film upon film of videos of women being beheaded, burned alive, killed, tortured. These are illegal, by the way. Some clips of these videos were played for the courts, and it was really, really bad. He was watching these videos 24 hours before he went out into that sub with Kim. He was watching it like that morning. Whether he was watching for satisfaction or to prepare himself or for both, it's unclear, but it was really bad. And if you guys don't know what a snuff film is, it's super legal. They basically depict real life murder or torture in a video. Like it's not like Hollywood where things are CGI'd, it's real. And typically the victims are women. 
Now, he tries to convince everyone that his interns used his work computer at work and they're the ones watching this. Yet he's trying to bring like everyone down with him, like all these young people who had given so much of their youth, time and energy to help him with his dreams. He's going to try and tear them down. Thankfully, no one believed him, but one intern would later testify that the day before the murder, Peter was asking him, hey, do you want to see something cool? I found a website where you can look at um, unreleased crime scene photos of victims. And the, the intern was very terrified, but he still didn't think that it was that alarming. He didn't think that Peter would kill someone. He just thought it was, it was very strange. Side note, authorities believe the torture inflicted on Kim's body was done um, around the time of death, so either shortly before or shortly after. They cannot be certain, but they stated it was probably inflicted with a knife, sharpened screwdriver, ties, metal pipes, and a wood saw. And the biggest question people had was, why would you need a wood saw on a steel submarine? Unless you were doing something else. There were 37 markings on Kim's body indicating that he had made puncture wounds. So now Peter has a new story because her head has no evidence of trauma and he's going to need one during trial. Trial starts and he debuts his new little alibi or new little story. She did not have blunt force trauma on the head because she actually died of carbon monoxide poisoning. He stated that she was down in the sub while he was trying to get the hatch to work because the hatch was stuck. So he's trying to lift it, pry it open. But since the engines were still running, somehow there was an issue and carbon monoxide was getting inside and Kim died within 10 minutes. The reason that he didn't tell this truth, quote, from the beginning was because it took her 10 minutes to die and he didn't want Kim's family and friends to be in pain knowing that it was not a quick death. So he made up the hatch story which was quick and sudden which i don't know if that makes any sense in fact i think blunt force trauma to the head is much more shocking of a thing to hear not because i believe his current story but it just makes no sense the prosecutors straight up told him then well why did you straight up asked him then well why did you cut her up he just stated very eerily i had a big problem what do you do with a big problem you cut it into small pieces he also stated he didn't see how it matters that he dismembered her body because she was already dead. Wow. So with all of this coming out, he's still sticking with his story that it was carbon monoxide. Peter's biographer and those who used to be close to him said that Peter overestimates himself. He believes that he can convince people. I mean, he did it with submarines, he did it with rockets, and now he thinks that he can do it with murder. That makes sense. Yeah. Prosecutors heatedly told Peter, like point blank in trial, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I guess that made Peter think about shifting gears in the trial. He starts trying to strike the hearts of his audience. He kept talking about his cats and how much he loved his cats and how he needed to go home to his cats. His cats depended on him. And everyone was like, what does this have to do with the case? It was so strange. It felt like he genuinely believed that his wants and his needs and his cats were more important than a person's life. A person's life that he took. Like, this guy is a full-blown narcissist, and it was starting to come out in court. In fact, his psychiatric evaluation was revealed in court, and it read, Severe lack of empathy, remorse, and sense of guilt. Relishes in watching violent videos. The psychiatrist also jotted down, Personally deviant, narcissistic, unconcerned, lacking remorse, regret, and guilt. A few other things come out in court. Multiple women were called to testify against Madsen, and they all stated that he was very normal. They did not think that he had a proclivity to violence or aggression in any way. Many of them had met him at sex parties, like BSM parties, which I know the media like tried to run with it, and they were like, oh my god, BSM. That had nothing to do with it. They were all consenting adults at these parties, and on top of that, these women said that Peter never seemed aggressive. He always respected boundaries. He was a little weird. He would text women sometimes things like, I'm just a perverted poly with a dream of taboo-free places where all adults in their right mind can teach each other to do whatever they want. Sick, perhaps, but there's no cure. The woman said otherwise he was very gentle. That's what they said. And I want to iterate that these women are not going into court questioning the validity of what happened to Kim. This is them telling the courts how shocked they were and how well this man hid his true intentions. These women were disgusted. They were not saying these things in defense of Peter Madsen. Because at the same time, there were disgusting people online basically victim blaming Kim. Saying that it was weird for her to go in the sub with someone she didn't know. Forgetting that it's quite literally her job. Male and female journalists have to do this all the time. And typically the risks are higher. And they're higher for female journalists. So what do we do? Should we start telling women to stop being journalists? 
Or should we start telling people to stop killing people? I think the answer is very clear. Other horrible people judged the fact that she wore a dress on the submarine. They judged her for not wearing long pants. They were like, why else would you wear a dress to a sub? Wow. Another netizen commented, the video of her leaving in the sub gives me the impression that she's going on a date rather than a journalist on a mission. So I think these women were trying to show that every single woman out there, every single female reporter, every single reporter, no matter their gender, every single person who vaguely knew Peter would have gladly gotten in that sub that day. So this is how unassuming he is. And that is so much more terrifying. Other women said, while he never did anything super alarming, he did have this weird energy about him. It, some people said that he kind of viewed women as playthings more than human beings. They didn't really see a hatred for women, but, th you know, probably well hidden. These are just little things that they would pick up here and there. Oh, and side note, Peter is married. He was married in 2011, and he and his wife had an open marriage. Once he was arrested, his wife divorced him and never spoke publicly about this case ever again. Another important message came out during trial where he had jokingly um, texted one of his friends that worked with him. And one of the women that he worked with jokingly texted him, Peter, you got to send me a little death threat or something so I can get my work done faster. Like, I need some pressure. I'm working so slowly. Wait, I don't, I don't follow. What's this? What does that mean? She's like, you need to scare me into working more. Because I'm like, we're moving so slowly. So, like, send me a death threat. Because technically, Peter's her boss. Oh, 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 oh. So, you know, they were this known... This was before, right? Yeah. Oh. But his messages, again, in the context, he's joking, yes. But it's eerily similar to what it said that he did to Kim. He said, ha ha, okay, I will tie you up in the Nautilus and pierce you with skewers. Then my knife will come out and I will look at your throat, looking for the artery. I have a murder plan and it's going to be great pleasure. April 25th of 2018, after 11 days, the court reached a verdict and Peter Madsen was sentenced to life in prison. After serving 12 years in Denmark, you can apply for pardon. Average life sentences um, in Denmark, you typically serve 16 years. Wow, what? Yeah, so it's hard to say if he'll ever get out, but um, yeah, it still doesn't explain why. After he was sentenced, he had one final change in his story where he does admit to killing Kim. He doesn't explain how he did it. He doesn't go into detail on any of that. He just makes it about himself. He did multiple phone interviews while he was in prison. And I'm going to read a lot of the quotes that he said, and it's really chilling. He said, I didn't go around living a wonderful life and suddenly bang, I got evil. Something made it happen. This is my confession. What the f*** happened? How can it be a mystery to you guys that good comes in a package with bad? There aren't heroes and bad guys. They're just humans. And under the right circumstances, under the right kind of pressure, under the right mistreatment, you can make people do just about every horrific thing to each other that you can think of. Okay, look, even now he's killed someone and he's trying to be this, this voice of teaching, this voice of reason and philosophy and mm -hmm. the one that is poetic about life. And it's just really agitating. He continues, you're looking for an explanation. Why did this happen? Peter said that he was so frustrated at his rockets not succeeding. He felt like he was no longer the sole center of attention, and he started. it started to really mess with him. The way Peter says it is that he was being used. So remember how he started Copenhagen suborbitals with a co-founder? Well, the co-founder allegedly came up to him and was like, hey, you can help build the rockets, but you can't be at the launches anymore. I don't think that this happened, but for whatever reason, there was drama and Peter was kicked out of Copenhagen suborbitals. He started his own rocket company, literally in the same lot, just like looking at Copenhagen suborbitals every day he went into the workshop. And his own rocket company was not going well. And I think the problem was, you know, when he started Copenhagen suborbitals, he's thinking, I'm going to get the glory, the fame. It's going to be about me, me and my rockets. But to build a rocket, you have to bring in a lot of knowledgeable people. And these knowledgeable people are not going to just say, yeah, boss, to everything you say, because you're building a freaking rocket. You need to do it right. So a lot of these people, when he would say something dumb, they'd be like, that's dumb. We cannot do that. Physically, we cannot do that. And he would get so irritated. People stated, Peter could not cooperate with people. I mean, could not. He loved drama. He liked the feeling of being the only one that had input. He hated being ignored. If his input was ignored, he would get extremely aggressive and angry. And the more you ignore him, the more incensed he would get about creating drama. And sometimes he couldn't stand not being the smartest guy in the room. 
And when you're building a rocket, you're not going to be the smartest guy in the room. Peter's biographer said, Peter lives in a world where there are winners and losers. And at this point in his life, he was losing and he was losing big. So two weeks before the murder of Kim, he had a rocket launch that was prepared for his new company. And they had to cancel it because they were, it wasn't doing well. For him, it wasn't, his project was never submarines. Peter's project was never rockets or the love of making things. Peter's project was Peter Madsen. That was his project, just being known, being this character, being respected and in control. Got it. So whatever he could do to get that, it wasn't actually the subs or the rockets. So Peter will never talk about how much he regrets the crime or what he actually did. He just talks about how stressed out he was and how miserable he was and how he was pushed into killing someone. He also has this moment where he almost feels bad for himself and he says, if somebody tells you that you're a narcissistic psychopath, the only way that you can make the verdict correct is to become that psychopath. I know you guys want your monster. I sense your hatred, but it doesn't make any difference. There is no closure to be found here. Now, this is crazy, but October 20th of 2020, after 30 months in prison, Peter escaped. He managed to build a weapon in jail, threatened the guard to let him out, and he started making a run for it. It was a rather brief escape that ended with him sitting on the grass and sharpshooters surrounding him in Denmark. So again, this is, um, it's a lot. He just keeps proving to be worse than imagined. And of course, the question is lingering, has he done this before? An officer on the case said, this is his personal opinion, not the official police opinion. He said, what happened is very rare that you commit a crime like that as your first violent crime. Abusive or sexual crimes might have come first, just maybe not caught. It said that they had been looking into connections between Madsen and any unsolved disappearances or unsolved violent assaults against women. So far, there are no concrete connections. There have also been talks that he's a serial killer. I mean, that's in the air, if he was or not, but many state that he would perfectly fit the profile. Even in the Netflix doc, there's footage of him before the murder where he's trying to make his own movie, and he would get angry at work and he would say things like, I would like to kill someone with a spoon, and I would choose the person by chance. He then told the videographer that he was going to hack her to death, and she gasped, like, you're going to hack with an axe, like, hack me to death? And he said, no, hug. You heard hack, I said hug. But that was um, definitely an unsettling moment in the doc. I think the case just devastated a lot of people around the world. The world lost another talented voice whose whole life mission was just to help others. But it's also another grim reminder that women are not safe doing their jobs. Kim once said to a friend, I only have questions about agency as a woman and if we will ever be free. No matter what we do, leaning towards no. Most female journalists said that they wouldn't have thought twice about going in that sub. That's just the job you have to do. You're not going into the sub with a known war criminal, just a man who built the sub. She was just doing her job and she ran into a killer. And he truly is an evil person that felt like he could just do something to someone. And he, he's kind of like this, he thinks he's a main character villain. He wrote once, nothing is sacred in hell. No morals, no ethics. Only your own disgusting, selfish ego. Give in to your anger. Use the knife. Hell is permeated with an evil that penetrates your head. He wrote, you need to choose between heaven and hell. And if you choose hell, a whole new world opens up. In his head, he's like the Hades, the god of hell. In his mind. But in reality, he is just a loser in jail now. He will be forgotten. Kim Vall will forever be remembered. Kim's family and friends created the Kim Vall Memorial Fund, and they help female journalists. Her mom said, humanity needs more courageous women like Kim. Women who have the endeavor to tell, give their voices to the weak, and make this planet a better place to live. Kim, we miss you. I'm going to link the fund in the description. And that is the case of the missing submarine. What are your thoughts? Leave it in the comments. Please be safe. And I will see you guys on Sunday for the mini-sode. Where we will be back in our Rotten Mango setting.